I'm just completely thrilled to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm gonna pull up my presentation here. Okay, I'm gonna do something um, they tell you not to do, which is uh, I'm gonna bury the lead. You're already aware that I'm gonna talk about a new hominin that was found in a cave. And so I'm gonna leave it at that because I kind of want you to have the experience the way I did, um, which was coming in completely blind, um, except for, you know, those headlamps. Thank goodness. So to make sure we're all on the same page. <laughs> I'm a paleoanthropologist which means I'm interested in the fossil record of uh, all of the hominin relatives of ours, and that refers to species that have uh, evolved since the last common ancestor that we shared with our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, and also the bonobos. So we're gonna kick off real quickly here with our first survey quiz question. What did hominins evolve first? Now, y'all heard that uh, Darwin hypothesized a collection of traits all evolving together, and it was a really strong argument that he made, but he was still wrong. So, we've got options here. We've got obligate bipedalism, which basically means that uh, you're forced to walk on two legs terrestrially on the ground. Um, increased brain size, small canines, and stone tool use. Oh, here we go. Yes, guys, you're right. Small canines for the win. <laughs> kind of a shocker, you know, because of all of those traits, they're kind of understated, but there's such significant implications for having small canines when you think about what large canines were used for. But I'm not going to talk about that now. There we go. All right, so to understand what was so significant about the Homo naledi discovery, and we didn't know it was Homo naledi at the time, so this, this hominin discovery. Uh, to really understand that, it's important to know the state of paleoanthropology in 2013. Hominins are rare. We don't find them very often. It may seem like we're always announcing something new, right? Like every year or two, oh, there's a new discovery. That's literally the entire extended director's cut of the hominin story. Uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration, I'll admit, but you really do hear about most of what we find, which means that there's a lot of pressure on paleoanthropologists to discover a hominin, and there's a lot of complexity around sharing your discoveries. There was also this notion that South Africa was pretty played out. We'd found all of the hominins we were going to find there. And at least as of 2010, that really wasn't an unreasonable assertion to make because 1995 was the last time we'd found a new hominin skeleton that was significantly notable. And this thing, this is Littlefoot, cutie, um, was found in Sturkfontein, which is a figurative stones throw away from the Rising Star cave system, which at that time was not recognized as a paleoanthropological destination. So Littlefoot, you can see here, is encased in stone. And that is the state for most South African discoveries that are in the Pleistocene. They're usually found in caves, part of a commingled assemblage of hominins and other animals. And they're all stuck together. And Littlefoot has been continuously excavated for 22 years now. We are still waiting on a thorough publication about this hominin, which means that most of the paleoanthropologists looking to work on Littlefoot, or even compare it with other discoveries, are still waiting. So I have to admit that the notion that South Africa was kind of a dismal destination for hominins <laughs> was something I didn't really question. Uh, I basically took myself everywhere else 
but Pleistocene South Africa. Um, so I ended up in Dmanisi, which is in the Republic of Georgia. That's where the earliest hominins outside of Africa have been discovered. That's a very early Homo erectus there. I also worked in Europe, as you now know, um, at a Neanderthal site called Neumark Nord. That was in Germany. I went to Pinnacle Point, which is in South Africa, but is a very recent uh, anatomically modern human site and place where we see some of the earliest habitual use of marine resources. So that's exciting because that's a great new uh, protein source. And I went to Olduvai Gorge. So when it came time to pick a place to focus my PhD research, I went to East Africa, not South Africa. Um, this took me to Olduvai Gorge, where I studied questions that would help me answer really what it means to be a member of our own genus. And again, I'm not going to go into too much of that there. But what was significant about it is that it ended up really preparing me for the kind of research that I would do as part of the Rising Star workshop. Um, you'll also see there's some footprints. I had the great fortune to get to be part of a team that re-excavated the Lytoli footprints last summer. Um, you know, they found some new ones. Yeah. Uh, so that was absolutely incredible. So this was what I was up to um, over the last six years or so when one day I woke up and pulled over my computer and I turned it on and there was this Facebook blast. I'm going to read it to you. Not the whole thing, I promise. So this is from Lee Berger, whom I just started following on Facebook. Uh, and he posted this to the Australopithecus sediba group. And I'm going to talk about what that came about from in a moment. Um, so he starts out by saying, dear colleagues, I need the help of the whole community. And then he goes on to ask for excellent archaeologists and paleoanthropologists with excavation skills that can drop whatever they're doing and fly to South Africa in one month. And here's the part that I highlighted. The catch is this. The person must be skinny and preferably small. They must not be claustrophobic. They must be fit. They should have some caving experience. Climbing experience would be a good bonus. They must be willing to work in cramped quarters, have a good attitude, and be a team player. Yeah. And I thought, I have never seen a job description <laughs> that excited me more than that. I was going to say that I was more qualified for, but uh, that's not exactly true because I don't um, have a lot of caving experience or climbing experience as of October 3rd, I think, the 6th, October 6th. Uh, I'd, I'd like I'd gone spelunking a few times, and I'd made it to the top of a climbing wall in a gym this one time as well. <laughs> so I imagine I was a bit of a hard sell. Um, what I did have going for me was that I would volunteer to hang out in MRI machines for fun, for science. So I thought that was pretty good evidence that I could at least hack it in close quarters. So how did we get to the point where Lee Berger is calling for small scientists to climb down into a cave and hang out for a month. Um, the, the key is this. He'd started looking at Google Earth to see if he could predict where he could find hominins in South Africa. And as I said, most people had written off this part of the continent as being productive. And within, I believe, a year of the presentation I saw where he was explaining his plans to look for uh, outcroppings that would indicate cave sites, he found a new hominin. He found Australopithecus sediba. This blew up in 2010, so right when I was beginning my PhD work. This was a major discovery, and it proved that for very little effort and a willingness to walk around a lot, you could actually discover new hominins in South Africa. And from there, he got the idea to start systematically exploring caves. Now that we can prove that there's something to discover, Let's do it systematically. And he pulled in these two guys. That's Rick and Steve. They were part of a spelunking club. And he brought them in, I think, in August of 2013. He asked them to start looking at caves systematically, like I said, uh, throughout the cradle of humankind, 
which is where Sterkfontein is, where Littlefoot was found, as well as Australopithecus africanus and many other uh, species that you're probably familiar with. So they started doing that late August, I believe. He also showed them what to look for. And by late September, they'd found it. One month. One month of looking in the caves in South Africa, and they found yet another trove of fossil bones. And I'm going to let them tell you about what that feels like for them. This is Steve describing what drives him to go spelunking. Caving has always been great. Um, Caving, you want to answer the question of what's around the next corner. That's like always the question you want to know. It's mostly fueled by curiosity. Um, but as you get into caving more and more, the scientific side of it comes into it. You want to know how did these places form? What happened here millions of years ago? What happened here millions of years ago? Basically, it creates a fascination with this whole environment. In my wildest dreams, I would never have thought that caving would take you to what's happening here. <laughs> you could always call this a bit of an accident. So, my caving buddy and Derek, um, we were out exploring this cave on a Friday night. Um, we got into a very remote section of the cave, a part that I'd never been in before. And in that section, we stumbled upon fossils. <laughs> Yeah, at first um, we didn't exactly know what fossils meant. We started looking around a bit more and we found a mandible, and I thought it was going to be this was probably something that, that was really good, I was very excited about. <laughs> That's how Monaletti, you just saw it. <sighs> so these were the photos that were able to launch a dozen anthropologists. This is so much bone for us. Just an extraordinary discovery. Based on this, Lee could see that we were probably looking at one of the most complete skeletons in uh, the history of paleoanthropology in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you'd seen that slide earlier. As of the Australopithecus sediba discovery, those were the five most complete skeletons that we have from Sub-Saharan Africa. Three of them are from East Africa, two of them are from the same place in South Africa. Those are the Australopithecus sediba skeletons. So to have the opportunity to excavate yet another skeleton was career making and professionally one of the most satisfying things I could have imagined. And so that was when he sent out that Facebook notice in October of 2013 with the idea that we would begin excavating 1st of November. And we did. So this is the group of people that actually went into the cave to excavate. Uh, we have Becca, myself, Ellen, Marina, Lindsay, and Hannah. These are incredible anthropologists, archaeologists, paleobotanists, paleoanthropologists. I can't even express to you how fortunate I was to be a member of this team, especially without all my caving experience. But that's just a small part of it. And this, this photo is still just a small part of all the people that donated their time to make this excavation possible. We had spelunkers who would just hang out in the cave, making sure that we were safe for hours and hours on end. Without them, none of that would have been possible. And thanks to them, we've been able to keep the cave safe through collaboration with their caving club. So now people can still go into the cave, see parts of the rising star system, be there, and we know that the bones are safe. One of the most unusual and gratifying aspects of this expedition was that it was open from the beginning. This was an open access excavation. We were tweeting about it. We had a live blog going the whole time. We were sending out photos of the excavation using a comm system in real time. And I don't think that's ever been done before. 
Since then, we've also kept it open. The publications are open access on eLife. And all of the fossils, not all of them, all of the most useful complete fossils currently uh, have been scanned in three dimensions and you can go download them at any time. You can have 3D prints of them made at your local library. So I just want to put a shout out to open access because that's actually made this process so much more enjoyable and collaborative. And it means that anyone is able to study these anywhere in the world where they have internet access. Here's the tweets. Um, how about a little tour of the cave? Here's a schematic. This does not do it justice. <laughs> I don't know how else to, um, to represent this. So um, I'm going to sort of show you where we are in the schematic as I show you photos of what the cave looked like in that place. So here's the entrance. is really a fairly breathtaking thing to descend down there. Just a little bit beyond that view, there is an opening in the ceiling, in the, in the cave ceiling, and so you have another shaft of light coming in and some plants growing out, and it's really beautiful. It's a wonderful place to sort of sit and collect your thoughts before heading into the cave. A little further in, you come to what we started calling the Superman crawl. This is a tunnel that is effectively like a cartoon mouse hole in a wall. Uh, it's at, um, at its narrowest, it is 10 inches tall. So for me, that means using my, my elbows and my knees and toes to, to sort of inch along on my stomach. For some people, it was all like fingertips and toes getting through there. And one guy actually lost his coveralls. And we got that on tape. <laughs> a little further in, you come to Dragon's Back. And this is a piece of the ceiling that fell. And it is essentially a sheer drop on either side with these ridges as you climb up. So you're basically looking upwards towards the top of Dragon's Back as you move along the ridge. And then you come to the final shoots. In this image, you're looking straight down. And this is the reason that Lee Berger was calling for small archaeologists. At its narrowest point, it is seven inches, which means I kind of had to do this awkward shimmy thing like that to get down. I'm not going to demonstrate much more than that. <laughs> and then it drops off. There's a, like a 10 to 12 foot drop at the bottom. So you're squeeze, 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 and then free falling. Except we put a ladder there because, you know, we know how to use tools. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the the credibility slide next. This is a, a little video about how tough it is to go caving. Okay, this is us talking about all our bruises, <laughs> and uh, and basically comparing how tough we are as we go through the cave. The thing is, you know, you spend. Uh, three weeks doing the same route over and over again, and actually the danger doesn't come from the work itself, it comes from getting too accustomed to it. So that was something we always had to be conscientious of. It usually takes about 20 minutes to get in and 20 minutes to get out, but if you start to get confident, overconfident, um, that's where the, where the errors come in. So if we, if we were able to have a total commute of 40 minutes, we considered that pretty good. And here we are in the chamber. This area that we're leaning over is called the puzzle box. Our primary agenda, when we first got into the cave, you saw bones everywhere. So we needed to clear them off. But as soon as we'd done that, there was that, that white smudge you saw in those first, that first photograph. That is the outline of a skull. And that is considered especially precious for paleoanthropologists trying to promote science, because this is the face of your ancient relatives. So to have a skull is, is definitely a primary um, focus for us. So as soon as we cleared the surface of bones, then we really got to work on that skull, thinking that we'd be able to get it out in a day. 
And then two days went by, and then three days went by, and we kept hitting other bones to the point where we really couldn't move anything without moving four or five other things, and uh, hence the puzzle box term. So that one area that we excavated took three weeks and was less than a yard squared, and we didn't go more than this deep, full of bones. Fortunately, we had some really helpful technology, because if you can imagine trying to draw every single bone in three dimensions in order to give it a provenience for studying it later, studying that spatial relationship later, um, I mean, we wouldn't have cleared more than two or three, probably, uh, limb bones at most. So we had this really cool thing. It was a three-dimensional scanner. It's basically the size of a iron, and you hold it three to five feet above the surface you're trying to three-dimensionally scan, and it picks up that surface in real time. It's absolutely amazing piece of technology. And I think in not too long, it'll probably be something you can have on your cell phone. Also required some contortionist skills, because as we were clearing the surface, we couldn't step on any bones, since the surface was literally all bones. Uh, we ended up sort of wedging ourselves up onto the cave in order to avoid stepping on them. <sighs> I really enjoyed being down there. All right, so you probably already know the punchline to this. This entire excavation was launched with the belief that we had one very complete skeleton. Well, we actually had at least 15 individuals. This is the largest trove of fossil hominin bones um, predating the Middle Pleistocene by two orders of magnitude. Um, it doesn't mean quite as much as say, oh, we, we pulled out about 2,000 bones. That could be fragments of bones, right? But these were nearly complete in many cases. We have multiple examples of almost every single bone in the body. So how do we study something like this? Well, you get the, <laughs> you get as many people together as you can. Um, in this case, what we did was we actually asked early career scientists to join the project, to come to this workshop in South Africa in 2014 and spend five weeks just dedicated to researching Homo naledi. And this is, again, unusual in the same way that the whole project was open access to invite early career scientists to do something that is usually the domain of experienced, advanced paleoanthropologists is groundbreaking. It does so much for the careers of the people involved. And it's actually pretty clever because you're talking to the people that have the most up-to-date uh, databases of the hominins that they're working on. They have the most up-to-date information. Here's what we wanted to know. How can we get a date for Homo naledi? And again, I'm using, I'm using the name Homo naledi. We didn't call it Homo naledi yet. How can we get a date for this 2,000 bone assemblage? <laughs> Which species does it resemble? Can we fit this into any species that we already know? And then how did Homo naledi get in this cave? What is it doing in a nearly inaccessible chamber, deep down 90 feet underground? All right, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the dating, but I do have two survey questions for you. So how can we get Homo naledi a date? You guys ready to see your answers? All right. You guys know that Tinder didn't launch until 2012. You're all aware of that. <laughs> so the answer is uranium isotopes, among other things. So for carbon, you need organic material, which we didn't have. And there's kind of an upper limit of about 50 to 60,000 years for it, which you know we couldn't automatically rule out, right? Because we hadn't done the analysis yet. We didn't know that the species would be of a given age. 
Um, in fact, when we were doing this workshop, we were still three years out from having a date. I don't know if you're aware, but the date just came out on May 9th. Yeah, you're, oh, you're aware, you guys know. <laughs> All right. Here's what's more important, given how difficult it was to publish without that date. What does the date tell us? Yeah, it's kind of a trick question. It's just a single datum. It's just a point in time that we have represented. So to find out who it evolved from, who it was ancestral to, when it, when it evolved, and when it went extinct, what we really need is an analysis of the bones, which is what we were trying to do uh, at the workshop. And I, I think with 60 people spending five weeks of person hours solely dedicated to the analysis of this fossil assemblage, um, the work that came out of that was just incredible. But we've gotten really used to a date being the most significant thing that we can use to place hominin material in, in, a, in a, a genealogy, a human tree, um, that it became difficult for the field to accept a description and analysis of this material without one. So the answer was none of the above. All right, how do we study this species to figure out where it fits? Is Homo naledi, well, again, I'm telling you this like we didn't know at the time. So did these bones look like anything that we already knew? And the way that we approach this is by looking at uh, comparative anatomy. We look at our closest living relatives, we look at living people, and we look at the fossil assemblage. And I have a little bit of a schematic here to explain how we do this. Normally, like I said, you know, we're lucky to find a piece of bone, a, a, a whole skull, maybe some teeth, um, and then we have a few skeletons to compare with, and then a bunch of isolated material. Um, so if we have just a tooth and it looks too similar to multiple species, then we really can't say in good conscience what species we're looking at if we find this isolated tooth. Um, sometimes we're lucky and we find a couple of things in association, and then we can say, okay, this pelvis and this tooth clearly belong together, and as such, it really must be hominin three that we're looking at. So we can assign a species to this uh, pair of bones. But we had the opposite problem. <laughs> we had at least 15 individuals who all looked the same and didn't look like any of the bits that we already knew from the fossil record. So we had to kind of change the, our approach here for how we studied it. And in brief, what we found was this. We had curved fingers, which are primitive, but we had long thumbs, which is derived or modern, and, uh, and there was even a unique trait, like the distal part of the thumb, the thumb tip, is oddly broad. It's a real fat thumb. I'm not sure what that means, but we see it repeatedly in the assemblage. Um, small teeth, small pelvis, thin arm bones, those things, let's see, small teeth is derived, that's more like us, but small pelvis, thin arm bones, small brain case, all of that is more primitive, more like something we'd expect to see one to two million years ago. And then we see a petite brow ridge, which is more recent. And we see this really thin femur, which is kind of unique in the fossil record. So we have unique features, we have really ancient looking features, and we have very modern looking features. The foot, you can almost not distinguish from our own. Where does this fit? It's a completely unexpected mosaic. And for that reason, we felt fairly confident that this was a new species. This was not something we'd seen before. So that unique combination of traits, the fact that it's repeated over and over and over again in an assemblage of over 2,000 bones, uh, representing at least 15 individuals who, by the way, are all different ages. We have everything from infants to children to tweens to adults, and we have elderly who are so 
uh, advanced that they've actually worn their teeth down to the roots. So we have one of the most demographically complete assemblages we've ever seen as well. I'm going to leave you guys this as something to ponder. Maybe, maybe we can talk about it later. How did they get in the cave? Again, all ages, 15 of them at least. We know that they entered at different times based on the geology. There were no other animals in this cave. That means no other animals could get there. There's no evidence for occupation. We didn't find any stone tools, which was a bummer. It's deep in the dark zone of this cave. And there were no other entrances. We can demonstrate that geologically as well. So this continues to be a hypothesis that we have to test and test and test. How did they get in the cave? And at this point, the only one that, uh, the only explanation for how they got in the cave that we've been unable to reject is that they were putting bodies there deliberately. With an age of 230 to 330,000 years, we're now in the middle Pleistocene. We're in a time range where human behavior is something that we accept, except we don't usually accept it for something that looks this primitive. So it's something that paleoanthropologists are now grappling with. To whom can we extend the treatment of the dead? This is the cave on the last day. We cleared the surface. You can still see there's bones sticking up there. I love this image. It completely captures how peaceful this place was. I'm going to leave it there. I'll talk to you guys later.